Thanks for coming in. For those joining on live streaming, thanks for virtually being here. It's a fun time. Every time I come to reInvent, I just go, man, this, this, is, this is bigger than I expected. It's, it's bigger than it was last time. Super exciting. My goal for today's session is to convince you of a couple things. One is the cloud is fundamentally different. And I'm going to give you examples to show why I think it's fundamentally different. If we achieve my goals, what will happen is every company represented by people in this room will make sure that you have one production app at bare minimum in the cloud. And the reason why you've got to have it is this is real, this is huge, this is the next decade of our industry, and you've got to be getting that experience now. For those that are in the room, good call. And for those that are already running apps, better call. It's really important. If you're, comp if you're not personally involved running one of those apps at your company today, do it at home. Do it yourself. Um, funny story. I, um, I was asked at a company I worked for some time back, um, people were having trouble believing this S3 thing. It's impossible. It's so cheap. Couldn't happen. And so I wrote a fairly substantial app against S3. I tested the heck out of it because it was demoed all over the company, all the way up to the CEO. It matters. that These CEO demos never go well. You, you test and test and test and test. So it went, went OK. Funny thing is, I got a bill for $3.11. Whoa, this is different. This really is different. It is phenomenally different. OK, big transitions do happen. The big transitions that I've seen, I was lucky enough early on to be involved with the transition from mainframes to Unix servers. I was lead architect on DB2 when we ported to Unix. It was a great time. It was a wonderful time because you get to go to customers and you actually help them. You get to help them get better value. It's phenomenal. I get to do it again on SQL Server and helping customers get to x86 servers. These big transitions happen rarely. We're super lucky to have, I'm super lucky to have seen those two. We're super lucky to be, to be here for this one together. It's a, it's a big deal. They're rare. If you can make the call on what's, what's irrelevant and, wh and which of these transitions are real and actually going to be matter in a big way, then, you're, ready, then you, you know, you, you're on the right side of that wave. It's phenomenal for your career. It's made a huge difference for mine. And it's just so much more fun to be on the, on the growth side of some of these curves. So big trend. what's different on this one is the speed. The speed with which this is happening. And you say, well, why? What, what, what's, what's different? Partly, it's two things, in my opinion. Two, one thing is great value. If a transition yields great value, it happens faster. Makes sense. Second, less blockers. In, in the other transitions, you would have to buy a Unix super server. You'd have to find a way to get Oracle installed on that server. You'd have to build an app. You'd have to get it deployed. I mean, this takes months if you're smart and creative. And it might take years at slower companies. The difference is in the cloud, all that friction's gone. You don't have to install software. You don't have to get hardware. You can have Oracle up and running this evening and have an app running tomorrow if you choose that stack. And if you choose a different stack, you can do that too. And so those two things make this one really different. A couple, couple metrics on, on, on growth, just because everything I'm going to talk to you today has got a foundation and scale. It's only possible because of scale. And so let's get a couple data points on scale. Amazon S3. 132% growth. EC2, 99% growth. Overall business, overall business, over a million customers. Why do you care about a million customers? If you're on a platform with a million customers, it means there's huge ecosystem of, of providers that are running on that platform. It, mean if you, it means if you ask a question, other developers are solving the same problems. If you're piling on the big ecosystem where everyone else is, it's easier to get your job done fast. And what I'm going to show you today is that volume allows us to reinvest into the platform. And the reason why you're seeing such growth this week in, week in the services that we're offering is because of the support that you've provided us over the last three years. Thank you. Because of that, we're able to keep reinvesting deeply into the service and keep innovating. One more data point. Gartner estimates the overall all the competitors of in, in the cloud industry, all 14 of them, have one-fifth the aggregate capacity of, of, of Amazon, AWS. 
It's a pretty phenomenal delta when you think of it. And again, thank you for making that possible. Let's look at one more data point on scaling. I happened to be in the room when we came up with this one, and I'll, do, I'll give you the background on it. It's, 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 it's a, I find it an amazing number. The background on it is I met Rick Delzell and Charlie Bell at High Performance Transaction Systems in 1999. Rick and Charlie ran Amazon.com infrastructure at the time. We had invited them. It's a small invitational conference held every two years. We had invited them to come in because the industry as a whole was blown away by the scale that Amazon was running at. That's a big e-commerce system in the, year, in the year 2000. So I was thinking, how often do we bring that capacity online? If that was every three or four weeks, that would be notable. That would be very notable. I was wrong on two dimensions. First dimension, it's not every three or four weeks. It's every day. The second dimension, it's not the year 2000. When Amazon was a $3 billion company, it was the year 2004 when it was a $7 billion company. Every day. Every day. Think of what that means. That means all of the component manufacturers have to get gear to our server and storage manufacturers. The server and storage manufacturers have to produce the gear and push it into the logistics channel. It has to get from the logistics channel over to one of our data centers, the right one. It has to arrive at a loading dock. People have to be there to wheel the, the racks into the proper locations in the data center. There has to be power, cooling, networking, ready to go. The app stack has to be loaded up. It has to be tested. It has to be released to customers. And then we've got to do it again tomorrow. It's amazing. If you weren't innovating, if there were no new services, I'd still want to tell you how we do this. I think this is actually interesting all by itself. What's changed in the last year? We've done it 365 more times. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of scale. OK, I'm going to cover a couple major areas of innovation. The we reason I've chosen these two areas, I've chosen networking because it's a, it's a problem. Networking is a red alert situation for us right now, industry-wide. There are, there are big cost problems in networking. And so I'm going to tell you what, how we dealt with that red alert and what's happened, because I, I think it's big work, and I think, I think it's notable, and I think it has great customer impact. Second thing I'm going to talk about is database. And the reason I'm going to talk about database is because database is hard. Database is the most likely reason you'll get woken up in the middle of the night. Database is the most likely reason why your application may not be running. It's probably the most expensive servers that you have. It's definitely the most, not definitely, it's likely the most expensive applications that you're running. That's where all the interesting hard issues are. If we didn't have state, we'd all be running huge scale applications. It wouldn't be that hard. So that's the two that I'm covering. Let's look first at networking, because networking, as I said, is a red alert. For those that know me, you know I track, I track and, and watch and drive my work on, on metrics. I like, to, I like to use metrics, and I especially like financial models. And it sounds kind of boring, but the truth is a financial model is remarkably educating on what's really going on. And this model, I won't, I won't go into all the details on it, this model proves wrong three or four of the most common beliefs in our industry. It just says, not true. It's just simply not true. The real data is, I mean, people speculate a lot in our industry. Having numbers tells you what's really going on. Here's one that's interesting that you don't necessarily see in this chart, but if you look at it over two years, you see it fast. And that is problem number one, the cost of networking is escalating relative to the cost of all other equipment. It's anti more. All of our gear is going down in cost. We're dropping prices all the time. And networking is going the wrong way. That's a big problem. That's a super big problem. It means you know, I like to look out a few years, and I'm saying well, over time, the, the size of, of the networking problem is, 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 is getting worse constantly. C can't let that happen. Just, it doesn't work. It's, I mean, we're, we're not going to have the right story for you two years from now if we don't solve that. So we can't do it. Second problem is, and it's a perfect storm, the second problem is at the same time that networking is going anti more, at that same instant, the ratio of networking to compute is going up. Partly it's driven by the fact that there's more compute in the given server generationally because more is working there. OK, that makes sense. Partly what's driving it is the cost of computing falls. As the cost of computing falls, the amount, the amount of advanced data analytics that get done go up. 
data analytics are networking intensive. If we're solving big, complex problems over many servers, it's a lot of networking traffic. It's referred to in the industry as the east-west problem rather than the north-south problem. So we got two things. We got a perfect storm in networking. What did we do about it? What we did, it's a little bit audacious, at least it felt like it when we started nearly five years ago, is we said, what if we built our own networking designs, we had ODMs build the networking routers themselves, we hired a team to build the, the protocol stack all the way to the top, and we deployed them ourselves in our network. Well, if you look at a lot of places, people would get you a doctor, put you in a nice small room where you're safe and can't hurt anyone. It's a big deal. That's, it's a big deal. But I told you, the data actually says you kind of got to do it. And so you got to do something. What did we do? Well, we did that. We did that. And today, if you're using our services today in every one of our data centers worldwide, you're running on this gear. What happened? Well, the first thing that we learned from doing this is, this won't surprise you at all, it's a lot cheaper. It is a lot cheaper. No surprise at all. In fact, it, it's the, the, just the support contract for networking gear was running tens of millions of dollars. So this is, it, it's, great, it's great value. But let me surprise you. At least it surprised me. The availability went up. How could you put together commodity networking gear we're professionals, we're, we're, we're good at what we do, or we're reasonably good at what we're doing, we're, we try hard, but, but why would it be better? Why would the availability go up? How's that possible? And you say, well, you dig below the surface, and you kind of understand what's going on. The way the networking world works is enterprise customers give lots of complicated requirements to, to networking equipment producers who aggregate all these complicated requirements into tens of millions of lines of code that can't be maintained, and that's what gets delivered. We don't use all that stuff. You don't use it, we don't use it, nobody uses it. But in aggregate, it all gets used somewhere. And it's, it's hard to do. And, the, tr and the, re the answer of why our gear is more reliable is because we didn't take on as hard a problem. And that's okay. That's, that's an, you're, that's, any way that wins is a good way to win. So we took on an easier problem, and it's more reliable. No surprise if you think about it. Another one is, we love metrics. We love to measure everything. We have rules that say, if you ever have a bad experience using our systems, our metrics have to show it. Think about that. If a customer ever has a bad day, your metrics have to show it. And we are very religious about that. And so what that means is that our metrics are getting better all the time. If ever a customer has a complaint and our metrics look fine, you're going to have a discussion with the senior level of the management team. Going to happen, for sure. Once you get metrics that really accurately measure how a customer is experiencing our systems, then what you can do is you can set goals on, how, on making them better. And every week, we can relentlessly drive these down. Do we, we, do we wait until release 17.3.2 that comes out every 18 months? Heck no. We, we're going to look at this every week. And we're going to crank the code very frequently. And so it, it improves faster. Even if it didn't start off better, it gets better. Final thing that's, that, that I think is, is super important is our ability to test. It proves, it proves how the cloud works. If, you want, if you're a network provider, and, you're, and the way all networking providers that I have worked with in past years work is they buy data centers, and they install servers, and they test. That's how it's done. Well, think about this. How often do you release new net gear? Not so often. And so this is inefficient. It's hard to buy big data centers. I was nervous because I can't afford to have this system not work extremely well. And so we took three megawatts of capacity, three megawatts of capacity, 8,000 servers. That was the test environment we ran. That's probably worth $40 million. Nobody tests at that scale. And so another reason it's better is we tested it more. And what does that cost? Technically, it costs $40 million, but not in the cloud. We rented it. It's, like, we used it for a couple months. It cost a couple hundred thousand dollars, and the job's done, and we're, and we're back to work again. So that's what we're up to. Let me take you through a little picture of our network from the very top all the way down to the network interface card, and we'll walk through level by level and say, how does this system work? And I'll point out to you a few things that may be a little bit unusual. OK. Worldwide backbone. There's 11 regions worldwide in AWS. You choose regions trying to get close to your users, close to your customers, or meeting jurisdictional restrictions. 
Having 11 regions is a real asset. Second thing is we use private links to hook up most of our, of our major regions. Why do we do that? Well, it turns out networking companies are invariably somewhere in the internet, somebody is fighting with somebody else over who pays who on peering, and there's not enough capacity somewhere, always going on. And somebody is not the world's best at capacity planning, and they're out of capacity. And somebody bought this wonderful big smoking piece of gear with huge buffers, and it's buffering. I mean, whatever the cause, it's just slower. And, it's, and no matter what you do, it's, it's going to be slower. And so the first reason we run a private net is it's just faster. Second reason is we actually can do capacity planning. We do make mistakes, but um, not that frequently, and we're always trying to do better. And so what happens is it's a more reliable link, it's, it's a cheaper link, and it is a lower latency link. It's just a happier place to be. So that's where we've chosen to be. Let's dig down and say, OK, that's good. Let's look at a region. Let's, let's take one of those 11 regions. I've selected US East, which is a very large region, and pulled it out and say, what's in US East? What does US East look like? Well, in all of our regions have, ex have at least two availability zones. US East happens to have five availability zones. A couple things you'll pick out on this. One is, the way, we, we, the way we wire up our facilities are different from most. Instead of having a data center being a region, we have availability zones being a region. I'm going to go into detail on why that is. Second thing that's unusual is we have separate transit centers. Two transit centers com are completely redundant. Those transit centers are connect connected up to um, private connections to customers, paid, uh, paid or unpaid peering, and, and paid for transit. That the, that's where our connections come to the rest of the world. If you lose one of those, it doesn't matter. If, a, if one of the AZs ever had a fault of any sort, all the rest of the AZs keep working. If one of the AZs goes down, if one of the links go down, it doesn't affect everyone else because we have redundant paths all over the place. The path that I'm showing you there, just because I had to show you something, those are real. That's exactly the way it is. And the reason why not every line is there is because that's just that's the way it is. There's a lot of redundancy in these systems. And every one of them has not got wire running in the same logical spot. And so the, the ditch digger, although they will come, will not come for both at the same time. And so that's our approach to regions. Let's look a little bit and say, well, what's in there? The first thing is I chose a, a kind of what I think is an amazing number. There's 82,000 fibers in there, just a phenomenal number. Um, the, the AZs themselves are, are less than two milliseconds apart and mostly less than one millisecond apart. So they're, from, a, from a latency perspective, they're very close. But if you play around with speed of light, you'll know that actually it's multiple kilometers is, is, is how far they're apart. So they're actually quite a distance apart from a safety perspective, fairly close together from a latency perspective, because fortunately speed of light, although it gets in our way all the time, it's not that bad. OK, so we've got 25 terabits per second um, of inter-AZ traffic. That's not the traffic inside a data center. That's not the traffic inside an AZ. That's the traffic between AZs. It's a wacko number. If you told me that five years ago, I'd just, yeah, right. Big number. Why do we have AZs? Like, it just doesn't, if, if, at first glance, you wouldn't think it would make sense because customers today do not use AZs and most of our competitors do not use AZs and AZs cost. They're, 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 they're big DWM, dense, dense, um, dense wave division multiplexing metro area networks. They're, bit, they're complicated, they have costs. Why would we have AZs if, if that's not what customers use and that's not what competitors are offering? That's an additional layer that you have to justify. And here, here's the justification. The way most customers work, in fact, every customer I have ever talked to except Amazon, work this way, and that is, an application runs in a single data center and you work hard as you can to make the data center as reliable as you can and in the end you learn that about three nines is all you're statistically likely to get over a large number of applications over a large period of time. It's just a three nine problem. And you, you might get a tad bit better, you might get a tad bit worse, but rough numbers, it's three nines. As soon as you've got a high reliable app, you run in two data centers. Everyone knows it. And so the, 
Customers that are running high value apps are going to run into data centers. And the way that's done in our industry is they're geographically widely dispersed because it would be absolutely insane to have two data centers side by side and try to call that, that that's the way you're getting more redundancy. So you want some space. And so usually they're a long way apart. Because they're a long way apart, the return trip time is fairly long. New York, LA is about 70 milliseconds. Committing to an SSD is about one to two milliseconds. You cannot wait 70 milliseconds for a transaction to commit. So we know for sure one thing we learned right up front, it's not synchronous. It can't be. No one's running synchronous replication because it doesn't work. It, you, nobody can wait that long. And so the way it works is you commit to a single data center and absolutely as fast as possible you push to the redundant data center. It works pretty well. What do we know about that for sure? It loses data. Well, it doesn't lose data in the, in the non-failure case, but in the failure case, if you fail over between these two facilities, you do lose data. Now, you really don't lose it because every, cus every company is complicated. It has audit logs. There's lots and lots of other tracks, but it will take a week to get the system back to correct again. What does that mean? That means you don't fail over unless you absolutely have to. You just don't do it. And so this system works really well at maintaining availability when something very rare and, and very bad happens. If a data center bursts into flames, burns to the ground, gets hit by a tornado, gets run over by a truck, any of those things happen, if it's gone, this system works splendidly. So it's excellent protection against a rare problem. And we like it. And we use it for that purpose. However, what happens way more frequently is somebody makes a routing error, someone's app goes wrong, a load balancer is sick, something like that goes on, and this system cannot solve that problem. And the reason it can't solve that problem is Something goes wrong, it's been down for three minutes, you think it's gonna be only down for 10 minutes, do you fail over? Heck no, it's gonna be a week's worth of work, it's gonna look bad to customers, it's gonna cause an interruption, you do not do that. You're thankful you can do that if the, bird, if the building burns, but you do not do that unless you absolutely have to. So what happens, you lose availability. And for all those common events that happen, all, not all the time, but happen a time a year, those ones you have no protection against. That's what AZs are all about. In an AZ, you've got, you've got data centers that are a millisecond or two apart. You can commit to both at the same time synchronously. That is empowering. What that means you can do is you can, can, fail, you can, you can commit to both. At any moment, if you pull the plug virtually on a data center, the app keeps running. If you thought there was something wrong with this data center and you failed over and you were wrong, doesn't matter. Customers can't tell you did that. If you, if you, test it and says, oh, I was wrong. Fail back, customers can't tell. It's invisible. That, that's why I fell in love with, with Amazon.com back in 2000, is they described this system to me and I went, it's phenomenal. That's just phenomenal. It's, it's game changing in how an application's run. And so every customer of AWS has the option to run in this model. It's harder to write code to this model than it is to not do it. And so you won't do it for every app. And there's some that are, that, where you're concerned that an airplane could touch down, destroy a data center, bounce, very unlucky, land in a second data center, completely wipe it out. That, that, you know, that, that's, that's a bad event. But for high value apps, you want to be protected. And so for those, you can run inter-region replication. And so we got that capability. Every competitor has that capability. Every customer has that capability. But this is the capability that's fundamentally different. I think it's special. And we work very hard. And there are some costs associated with providing this option. Let's keep diving in. What's inside an availability zone? Years ago, people were speculating, well, you know, availability zone isn't a data center. It's probably just like two racks in the same data center. Not so much. An availability zone is 100% always, without ever an exception, a completely independent building. It is a different data center. So 28 availability zones tells you we have 28 plus data centers. And the plus is a good sized number. Why would we have more than one data center in an availability zone? Given we promised you that they would be independent failure modes, these data centers have independent failure modes. Why wouldn't we just have more AZs? And it turns out, customers don't want them. If you have two availability zones, it's great. And we always have two. If you have three, it's even better. If you have four, it's fine. If you have five, I'm not exactly sure what to do with them anymore. It's just, it's just, it's, it's kind of more than you need. And what customers really want is they want to know that if I deployed my app in availability zone number 16, 
don't tell me you're out of capacity in that zone. Let me throw it somebody else. I want to keep adding to my app. And so we, we don't want to run out of availability zone capacity, so we add data centers. That's what's going on. We're taking on that problem of making sure that your virtual data center doesn't run out of space. And, and that's why you see, believe it or not, we have some availability zones that have six data centers. These, th these are fairly substantial data centers as well. OK, let's, let's have a look at one of those data centers. Now we're drilling down inside an availability zone. Now we're drilling down to a data center itself. How big is a data center? Well, it's, it's pretty big. It's not as big as it could be, but it's 25 to 30 megawatts, rough numbers, 50,000 to 80,000 servers. Um, why don't we build bigger? We can easily build bigger. I've been, in, I've, been in, I've, been, I've been in data centers as big as 60 megawatts. Totally easy to do. The thing is, the return on largeness, the advantage of, of scale as you build a data center bigger and bigger, the early advantages are huge, the later advantages are less. And so if you go from 2,000 racks to 2,500 racks, it's a little better. And you, as you start adding more and more racks to a data center, the value of protection to a customer, I mean, sorry, the value of scale goes down. I mean, a, a tiny data center is too expensive. A, re a really big data center is only marginally more expensive per rack than a medium-sized data center. And so, and as they get bigger, there's a risk. The blast radius, if something goes wrong and that data center is, is destroyed, th the loss is too big. And so the value of getting bigger goes down and the cost of, goes up. And so in our view, this is around the right number. We've, and we've chosen to build this number for an awful long time. So that's why we don't run bigger. How about networking capacity um, provision to a data center. This is the capacity not inside the data center. It's wildly higher than this. This is the capacity coming into a data center. 102 terabits per second. A fairly substantial number. Again, you want to have control of networking costs so we can afford to keep doing something like this. Let's dive into the inside a data center, swoop down to a rack, from a rack, grab a server, from a server, grab a NIC. This one's important. If you look at, you know, I like to look at where the problem lies. I talked, showed you earlier in finance. If you look at the latency between two servers, if you want to send a message from this server to this server, where's the time get spent? And I'll just, I'll, I'll go quick. It turns out the software stack you have flowing from your app down through the guest OS, through hypervisor, um, down to the network interface card, the latency in that area is milliseconds. The latency of passing through the net, NIC is microseconds. The latency of spanning the wire, crossing the fiber, is nanoseconds, which is to say the only thing that matters is the, is the software latency at either end. In a small facility, not a small facility, in, in, in any of the facility sizes that I'm showing you, that's where, all the, that's where all the cost is. That's where the problem lives. And so, OK, we know how to solve that. There's a wonderful technology called single root I.O. virtualization. It allows a network interface card to, virtu to provide virtual hardware, to virtualize in hardware net network cards. That means each guest gets its own network card all by itself. Phenomenal and not that hard to do. And so you, know, you look at that and you go, it's not, it's not, it's not mind boggling. Why didn't we do this years ago? Why is this just what we're deploying right now on our newest instance types? It will be everywhere, by the way. Why are we doing it now when we knew about this for years? Well, the part of using SRIOV is not hard. Anyone can do it. What's hard is, wait a sec, wait a sec. This is, this, we need isolation in our network. We've got to virtualize the network. We've got to be metered on the network. We have to actually keep track of who's using what on the network. We have to have DDoS protection. We have to have capacity limits so you can't use more than, than, than what you've purchased and impact another customer negatively. All that stuff, well, if, if the guest goes straight to the NIC, you need somewhere to do all that very important stuff. That's the magic. That's the reason why it's taken us a long time to get to this model, it's hard to do, is, 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 the, is the short answer. Let's look at the value. What do we get from going to this model? Well, technology guys should know better than to demo anything to, to, to um, using a logarithmic scale, because it makes everything look boring. However, some of the gains are sufficiently big, I need a logarithmic scale. First thing to notice, we're looking at network latency 
in the TP50 case, this is average. What's the average latency improvement? And what I showed you is about 2x. So it's, it's pretty relevant. I mean, it's not absolutely earth changing, but it's pretty darn relevant. That's a, you know, you start to talk about a factor, it's a good thing. We're excited by that. But what we're really excited by, way more excited by, is look out to the limit. This is what talent comes to play, is if you get out towards the limit, you say, what's in the rare case, what's the maximum latency? If you look at the 99.9th percentile, what's the difference in latency out there? It's those outliers that are super annoying for apps. It's, those are the outliers that, that, that cause customers bad experience. Those outliers are the thing that's, things that find bugs in applications that mostly don't show themselves. The outliers are down by a tenth. They're down to a tenth of what they were on our old network. And this is measured on our gear, in our facilities, using previous, pre previous generation versus the current generation. So I think it's a pretty big impact, and, and I think it's pretty important. Another thing that you probably know is the server ecosystem and the storage ecosystem is way more healthy, way more healthy than the networking world. but. It's still not that efficient, and it's, it's nobody's fault. It's the, the server OEMs sell to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of customers with very diverse requirements all over the world. Well, that's complicated. You have to have a, ver a big distribution channel to reach all of these customers and to meet with them and to, sh and to demonstrate your servers and sell the servers and get support da data back. That's a big, expensive system. And that channel, that distribution channel, costs about 30%. There's nothing you can do. I mean, there's maybe something you can do, but not a lot you can do. You, you kind of need to talk to that number of customers. If you're selling to a cloud provider, or if you are a cloud provider, there's one customer. You, you just don't need a lot of discussion. I don't get, need to get taken to the Super Bowl this year. I don't need to play golf with anyone. We'll just buy our servers. And that's a cheaper system. That works better. That really works better. And as a consequence of, so of working that better, those costs are gone. They're just gone. It's just, I mean, it's not magic. It's just they're not there anymore. That's a good thing. More than that, way more important than that, the servers are actually designed for what we do. Normally, servers are designed for hundreds of thousands of users that have all these different requirements. We know exactly what we're going to use the server for. We know precisely the environmental conditions that it'll run under. We know exactly how we're going to use it and which application stack's going to run on it. And if anything ever goes wrong, we know exactly when that happened. And because we've got all that data, it means we can actually design with less engineering headroom. If a server ODM ships a server and there's something wrong with that server that has, and the box has to be opened, think of the cost of opening that box at tens of thousands of customers' sites individually spread all over the world. If that ever happens, for sure someone's losing their job, and it does happen occasionally, and it is really expensive. And what happens when you get burned really badly? You get careful. You get really careful. And what ha what's careful mean? Careful means there's huge engineering headroom that's not getting used because it's just so risky if anything goes wrong. Well, we're replacing thousands and thousands and thousands of disks every day. We have whole teams that do nothing but, but are really darn good at opening servers. And, and we know exactly where the data centers are. We don't have to travel a long way. We're already there. It's, the cost of a failure is just not that big for us. And so we don't need all that wasted engineering headroom. Again, it's, it's just, it's not magic. It's just, it's a different world. This is a different world. Here's another one that's different. Wild from my perspective. We know our environmentals well. We, do, we know how to build servers to a certain specification. We know exactly the mechanical design. We can influence the mechanical design. We can decide exactly what level of cooling. We never put the processors sh um, shadowed behind memory. We just design good servers as a consequence. The, the processors can be pushed harder. Through partnership with Intel, we have processors that are actually running faster at a given, given core count than is available in the open market. Again, it's, it's not magic. It's just because we're running in a simpler world. And I think that that's going to keep playing out, where we're going to keep finding situations like that where the world has a lot of protection because the cost of a negative situation is so high this is a different world. It's just different. And so I'll give you one example just because I couldn't resist. This is a storage rack. This is, what, this, is what people, this is what companies do not buy. So three years ago, we did this design. 
Three years ago, we did this design, and there's, there's probably not a huge demand for, for racks, excuse me, that are over a ton. 19-inch rack, 2,350 pounds with 864 disk drives. I suspect the reason why that design didn't exist three years ago other than ours is because nobody wanted it. Well, it turns out for some workloads, this is a wonderful design. This is a game-changing design. This is helping us get better prices in some areas. And so we have that. We have that beast, and I love it. Let's jump into relational database. Relational database is hard, 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 hard. It's hard, to, they're hard to install, they're, they're hard to afford, um, they're hard to take care of, they're hard to learn about, um, they're very hard to switch once you choose one. There's just a million reasons why relational databases are challenging. I can be critical because I've, I've worked on them for so many years. One solution is just don't do it. I mean, just flat out don't do it. Go, just go, go no SQL. And that's a perfectly fine solution. On that model, we've got DynamoDB. I showed you this last year. I showed you exactly the same chart. I said, let's take one region, let's take just one region, it's not the whole world, just one region, and say, what's the request rate the DynamoDB is servicing? And at the time, it was a little over two trillion per month. It's now climbed nice and steady to over seven billion per month. Last year, I showed a scatter chart of the latency, and it just danced around at around three to four milliseconds, closer to three. Just, and it stayed there the same. And I was proud because the team had grown at the rate that I showed last year, and it just stayed boring and flat. The latency never changed. The chart's the same. Have a look at my last year's slides. It's the same chart. And they've grown by 3x in requests, 4x on storage. It's amazing. At the same time, they're adding features. So we've got JSON support. We've got um, global secondary indices. The product, it keeps getting easier to use. And, but never, ever, ever is it going to become a relational database. We're not going to sacrifice scale in, in, in ever. And so this is always a scalable solution with very predictable latency. OK, but you still need relational databases. Some customers still use them. We still use them. I still use them. There are places that you can apply a relational database in, in a productive way. OK, what can we do to help make that easier? I mean, for, if you don't have to, don't do it. But if, if you do have to, there's times when there's just so much value in a relational database, it makes an app so much easier. What can we do? Well, the problems that we had is, well, we had cost as a problem. We can provide, um, we can provide a open source alternative. So we can drop the cost. OK, that's good. That's, that's progress. Um, another one is administrative complexity. OK, we'll host it in RDS. And that takes over a lot of the administrative complexity. Helps with that. Second one. But we've still got the availability problem. Availability is where, is where the high-end databases are most enterprise features exist. That's where the real money comes in. And so what can we do on that? With RDS, we solved a lot of the administrative problem. Let's go after, let's go after the multi-AZ reliability problem. Years ago, when I entered this industry, EMC came up with a product called SRDF. It was driven by the financial district in New York, where they wanted to run real-time replication between New York and New Jersey. EMC produced this log shipping solution, and they printed money with this thing. People would pay anything for it. And in fact, most of them did. Incredibly expensive, unbelievably important to, for, for super high availability applications. Oracle has done the same thing. Again, a very enterprise level solution. It's a good solution. It's very, very good, very reliable, but very expensive. Same thing again. It's, we'll just do the same thing, but we'll do it a lot cheaper. So multi-AZ RDS says we'll ship the changes between two availability zones. If one fails, we'll fail over the other, recover the database, bring you back up, and usually submit it, you're back and running again. So phenomenal capability. Because it's so cheap, rather than, service, rather than serving the 3% of the world that, ha that really has to have that level of reliability, I can't understand why we're not servicing the whole world. Because it turns out any data database that doesn't come up for some reason is going to waste somebody's time. Somebody has to go take action. And so I'm loving this number, is the number of multi-AZ RDS databases, because we're doing such a good job of driving the cost of this down, it's good technology, nothing wrong with it, it was just too expensive. And so because we're making that broadly available, we now have 40% of customers using it. My goal, I'd love to, see us, love to see us all get there, is I'd love to see this number around 70%. 
There's a few, there's a few applications with very disposable databases where it doesn't, it's not an administrative tax, but even test and dev databases are, 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 are worth running in this mode, in my opinion. Okay, we solved a little bit of the availability problem. We solved a lot of the administration problem. We solved a lot of the cost problem. One of the problems that's left is performance, in, performance of a s single MySQL database has limits, and the, the, the commercial systems are good. You get something for spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. No question. So what we've done is we've produced what you heard about this morning called, called Aurora. It's a new storage engine for, for MySQL. It's drop-in compatible. All MySQL apps just run, same as they ever did. Um, what's unusual about this there's quite a few things that are unusual about it. I mean, just doing a current state-of-the-art storage engine would have been worth doing. Take Jim Gray's big black book on transactions, implement it, because you would, you would all be, I would be happy. We'd all be happy. It'd be a wonderful thing. What the team chose to do, it's a little unusual, is they separated the storage engine away from the relational engine, which allows them to fail independently. They put a storage engine in each of three data centers. There's two copies in each data center, and they're shipping deltas down to the, to the storage engine so they're minimizing the amount of network traffic. And because logs are not the most efficient thing to operate on directly, they're transforming to a read-optimized form independently on each of those three different boxes. It's kind of a cool design. Unbelievably available. Six copies. If you, have, if you have one data center completely wiped out and a hardware failure somewhere else, it just keeps running. It doesn't care. It's fine. No problem. If you have one of those events where the plane hit both data centers, it's not super likely, but at least it doesn't lose any data. Every transaction's there. It won't run through that one, but every transaction is spin committed, it's there. And so it's an amazing step forward from an availability perspective. The thing you should criticize, at least the thing that jumps out is, but can I perform? Because this is, is looks like an expensive model. And it turns out, it is an expensive model, but it turns out, done well, latency, speed of light, it's not that frightening. Um, this actually can be done with pretty good performance. Let's look at the performance. Believe it or not, partly because MySQL is, is, is not absolutely the most modern technology available right now, partly it's, that's one advantage, but it's, it's running at, at more than 3x the write per, um, performance and more than 5x the read performance. And so I showed you that system, talked about how available it is, talked about what it can operate through, and it's actually, forget about, hey, I'll, just, I'll take it at the same performance. It's actually, it's solving the performance problem in a pretty big way. So this is big. Um, this is big. This has also got enterprise level features. DB2 MVS is able to find pages in its log. If you have a torn page in DB2 MVS that runs on the Z series mainframes, it is able to patch that page while you keep running. Phenomenal. Most databases don't do that. They just, it doesn't happen that often, and so they just stop running when there's a torn, torn page. This one will do that as well. Kind of, kind of impressive. Redshift. I worked on DB2 years and years and years ago. 20 years ago, we were working really, really, really hard on making a scalable data warehouse where you could have 128 nodes running a single statement in parallel, actually scale, and this whole mess looks like a single parallel database system. It's the thing that we've always wanted from high-scale data warehouses. It is in incredibly hard to, 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 to make them work. And of course, whenever I say it's incredibly hard, you know what they charge for it. Yes, hard is expensive. Um, these are incredibly expensive. This product is able to run on 128 nodes in parallel. This is running a lot of Amazon.com um, data warehouse workloads. It's running all AWS data warehouse workloads. Um, and it's running at $1,000 per terabyte per year. For, for the cost of these systems, it's rounding error. I mean, think what's possible if you can have a data warehouse on anything that's interesting to you. For example, what, what can I learn about disk failure rates over different batches? Just go try it. Just get the data and try it. It's great. It's absolutely phenomenal. Again, game changing. EBS. Won't spend any time here other than saying 
Watch us. Whenever you like something and start using it heavily, we learn. And so you loved SSDs. We made SSDs available behind EBS. Customers just loved it. And, and so we said, OK, we'll, we'll provide more um, SSD options. And so the first thing we did is we provide provisioned IOPS, which is really ideal for a database workload where we sign up with three nines of reliability to absolutely give you the number of IOPS that you bought. It's just like buying a storage system. And so, OK, that's great. General purpose IOPS says, listen, I'll give you burst capability. It's not good for a constant um, load that never changes like a database. But for almost every workload, it's an ideal choice. And we'll give you much better value for that. What we've done recently is we're able to support 20,000 IOs per second against, uh, against a single volume. So fairly big number. Power infrastructure. Worth spending a second here. Why would we design and build our own high voltage power substation? You can save a tiny amount of money doing that. And so we've done, we've, we've done a couple. Um, you could save a tiny amount of money. Um, probably wouldn't do it for that. What's useful is we can build them much more quickly. Um, the, I showed you the rate we were growing at. Well, that rate is not really a normal rate for, for utility companies. It's not, it's not the pace that they're used to operating at. And so the reason we did is we had to. It's, it's bottom line. Um, it's cool that we actually can, and we can have power engineers, and, and, and this becomes a skill center for us. P pace of innovation. Do you remember Andy showed you this morning 442 different services and major features released this year? That, that, Andy's number was so this morning. <laughs> Stated stuff. Glad you came. <laughs> 449. Just keeps cranking. And the thing that I'm really proud of is we knew we were going to, we knew the cloud was going to be important. Those of us that have been involved with it for a while, we know there's value here. We know we're going to get big. We're all scared to death that we, we don't want to become a big company and get slow and stop serving customers. So we're proud on two things. We're proud that as we grow, we keep delivering at the same pace. In fact, we're delivering at a faster pace. We're, and we're getting more reliable rather than less reliable, because sometimes pace gets negatively translated into quality. So we actually have a better quality record than we've ever had. We have a higher pace than we've ever had. And the final thing that we're proud of is we're working really hard to make all the same types of assets that are helping us move fast. That same test system that I use to test the network with 8,000 servers, that same system, we're making it available to you. We believe we can help every one of your companies have that same chart and keep doing it at any size. That's why I think the cloud is pretty special and why I'm glad to be able to talk to you a little bit today. Thanks for being here.